this is the stuff we discuss in class one video is on the discord uh, if you didn't have a chance to watch it some of you joined us a little late so try to watch it and if you have questions please post it on discord uh, we mostly talked about public and private blockchain differences talk about integrating blockchain into the product so you learned about the blockchain principles there were like five six principles which is like a distributed system which is immutable, which is very secure, right? Which is not as fast as a Visa card. It has their speed problems, obviously. Basically, you know the advantages, you know the disadvantages. And when you go to a company and start working as a blockchain product developer or marketer, uh, these are really important stuff to know intuitively uh, if there is a need to deploy blockchain protocols or smart contracts, uh, especially for that uh, system. Um, and we also talked about smart contracts. There were some questions about smart contracts. Will it replace law or where will, it, where will it be using other than DeFi or NFTs right now? That's the most of the cases, right? So we gave some examples, industry examples about where the smart contracts will be used. Uh, we talked about oracles and mentioned the oracle problem, continued with the tokenization and also uh, the technical and fundamental aspects or blockchain companies. Class, we will talk about the layer one protocols and the consensus mechanisms and proof of work we discussed a lot. We'll also talk about proof of stake, which is the main consensus mechanism of today's blockchain company. Uh, we'll revisit the scalability problem which we talked about in the first class and uh, that also will bring us to the blockchain trilemma and we'll talk more about proof of stake consensus we'll discuss what it is and then we'll little bit dig into the ethereum protocol what was ethereum one and what is the new ethereum which is ethereum v2 and what is gas price? What is the ERC-20 token? Tokenization of other layer one protocols means all these layer one protocols such as Bitcoin, BTC, Ethereum, ATH, right? They have their own coins. And uh, we'll talk about what is actually a coin and what is a token. And then we'll look at the other layer one token protocols or la coin like layer one protocols such as Avalanche, Solana, Cosmos, uh, maybe Polkadot. And then there are a bunch of others. Uh, and we'll try to a little bit understand what they are aiming to do, uh, which are competitors of Ethereum. Um, so we gave this picture several times and this is i think the most important picture summarizing the blockchain industry uh, why is it very important because it helps us compare the grants of blockchain the grant of blockchain means these are the blockchain companies that are providing services to other companies which we call the app decentralized app so like think it like google's flutter app it's the coding flutter coding or react native like basically they form the basis and using those languages you can create mobile app right so just similar to that using these layer one protocols which are written through some kind of programming languages and they have some consensus mechanisms that are predetermined they basically host hundreds thousands and probably in the future millions of decentralized apps and while they host those decentralized centralized apps, they have to be fast, they have to be secure, and they have to be as decentralized as possible, right? And uh, of course, they have to be fast. I think this is probably one of the most important aspects. And these companies are racing to be faster, and they are also racing to be scalable, right? Rather than secure, because they are not a Bitcoin protocol. Of course, it's important to be secure, but at some point, they have to somehow compromise security and boost their scalability and speed. Right. So that's what Solano did compared to Ethereum. And that's why it's called Ethereum killer. So look at how many transactions per second comparison, like Solano has 665,000 and Ethereum has 30. And the reason was because Ethereum was using a proof of work protocol, which means the security and decentralization was more important than the speed. And it wasn't scalable, obviously, right? Like a 30 transaction per second is a issue in the protocol. It brings a lot of gas fees for uh, all the developers, all the users. So Ethereum founders and all the other developers uh, were 
working hard for the last few years to reach the Ethereum 2 protocol so that now they will be the Solana kill. <laughs> and uh, there are, of course, other bunch of layer one protocols which are competing hard. And Avalanche is one of the biggest ones uh, racing with Solana. Uh, but also there is one important aspect of this layer one protocol. One of them is not really necessarily faster, but at the same time secure or scalability. All of them has their own advantages, but all of them also has their own ecosystem. So ecosystem means supporters i'm a big fan of avalanche right and i rather use avalanche let's say compared to cardano because i am more into avalanche just like i am a besiktas fan right so this ecosystem is very important and if you want to be like an ecosystem marketing manager or something like that you need to know that these Blockchain protocols now have Discord channels, Telegram channels, WhatsApp channels, and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. And they use Web2 incredibly a lot. They have to get new users. They have to get new developers, new startups built on their own system, right? Most of them are using proof of stake. And here, I believe on this picture, other than Bitcoin and old Ethereum, none of them are using proof of work. And then there is another consensus mechanism called sharding which we will not talk uh, in this uh, week uh, so and as a summary they are all working layer one protocols are all working to tackle to scalability problem which means transaction per second but they also have to be decentralized secure and scalable as much as possible so this is a snapshot from the coin markets and i looked at the proof of work tokens and i looked at the proof of stake tokens and these ones like in the rectangles they are all layer one company bitcoin ethereum litecoin bitcoin cash ethereum classic these are the biggest ones in terms of market cap and looking at the proof of stake sites cardano solana algorand tezos uh, Celo, and mina are the biggest market caps using proof of stake consensus so um, we'll look at what is proof of stake we all know what's proof of work and uh and we'll discuss more why Ethereum will switch to proof from proof of work to proof of stake. But uh, as you can see, these proof of work companies are really old. Bitcoin is like since what, 2006, like five, even older, but uh, like basically the market cap is starting to grow. So Bitcoin Cash and Ethereum Classic, actually once they were Bitcoin and Ethereum. So what happened is developers had a conflict. They said, oh, I don't want our software work like this. So I'm not working with you guys developers, but I am working with other developers. And that's called a fork. If there is a huge change in the actual protocol, it is called a fork. So uh, Bitcoin Cash is a fork of Bitcoin and they split way. One of them is called Bitcoin and the other now is called Bitcoin Cash. And Ethereum Classic is similarly. They were once working together and now they are two different protocols. So um, this is a scalability problem we were talking about. And the dilemma is uh, if a blockchain company wants to be both secure, super fast and and also super decentralized. Well, that is a tough thing to do, right? And some companies like Solano and Avalanche are focusing on speed. Some protocols like Bitcoin and other proof of work protocols, they focus on decentralization and some of them focus on security, right? This is the summary of this slide. Uh, like based decentralized means creating a blockchain system that doesn't rely on a central point of control right we talked about this a lot in the last two weeks and the other one is being scalable the ability for a blockchain protocol to handle as many transactions as possible right so that is i gave you from the previous example that's probably one of the most important stuff this being being fast the security is the ability of that blockchain system to operate as expected right basically secure from attacks hacks bugs or other issues and uh this is basically a niche uh a blockchain company is going through a lot of different process to demonstrate it if it is secure but uh this part is mostly uh, neglected at some points um so we talked about the scalability problem 
a little bit about Bitcoin. The Bitcoin has a one block and that block, I mean, it has a lot of blocks, but one block size is one megabyte. That means one megabyte block can host as many of transactions. I think that also corresponds to uh, Mohammed's questions. Like basically um, the one megabyte corresponds to maybe 300 transactions, maybe 250 transactions, but that's the block size. And the block is usually sold, basically its hash is sold around 10 minutes. And uh, 10 minutes corresponds to 600 seconds. And usually 600 times seven transactions per second is corresponding to 4,200 transactions. So we can say that a block of one megabyte can host around 4,200 transactions, right? Uh, and it can be a little less, it can be a little more, but what is limiting that is the block size, the one megabyte. Uh, if we go uh, the speed problem or the from one of the three lemmas, uh, the speed is just like the previous slide is determined by the block size, right? Like if it is not one megabyte, if I make my block 0.5 megabytes, then I can publish that block probably in maybe half of the time. Because why? Well, there won't be as many of transactions and the block will be smaller block. So speed is, we'll talk about this more, but it is the most important of the trade-offs uh, in the in that trilemma. The important thing affecting the speed is the consensus mechanism, right? So in the proof of work, there are a bunch of computers, they are at this background validating nodes and after validating nodes the miners are basically working hard to find the hash so that's a little bit uh hassly and problematic uh, solution right it that's why it takes 10 minutes for it for that block to be published so and developers figure this out and they said, well, proof of work is not what we desire to have. Let's have proof of stake. And rather than computers working, let's have validator nodes. And these validator nodes buy our protocol coin, layer one coin. So they actually devote their money, right? Because they buy those coins using their dollars or euros. And they buy our coins, they become validators. And being validators, the we can apply the proof of stake. And if those those validators, let's say 51% agree on a transaction and then that transaction is published. And of course, those are also running nodes. I mean, being a validator is not in person. Of course, they are also running nodes in the mainnet, again, like a spider web. The other issue is, as I mentioned, the security problem. And a lot of different exchanges are hacked and there are a lot of issues in their source codes. So hackers go into the codes because they are open source. They can basically figure out the vulnerabilities in the source code. They can exploit it, right? And a lot of different blockchain ecosystems, they can get hacked. And this is the, I think, issue with the blockchain. If being everything open source, the hackers are, of course, working at the background, as well as the security systems working hackers are always getting better and better right especially with different technologies ai and machine learning being in the game uh they have more resources if we look at uh the history there has been a lot of dao at so we mentioned a little bit about dao decentralized autonomous organization and actually ethereum has a big history of dao attacks because after a few years ethereum is found they also started a dao and the dao has got a lot of fun from different people including their own founders and developers and eventually this DAO got attacked by some hackers and the entire treasury entire fund of the DAO uh, is stolen not of course but some of them are given back but that shows uh, the vulnerabilities in the source code and the security comes first from my standoff so we'll talk a little bit of Ethereum Ethereum v1 Ethereum v2 and after Ethereum trying to get better and better they took a lot of years to publish or deploy it starting V2. Uh I think they are still the most crucial layer one platform. So what has changed in Ethereum side? Ethereum was just like a Bitcoin protocol, but instead of transferring money, basically those validator nodes don't just keep the transaction of a money transfer, but they keep the transaction of a if class, like ones, zeros, like a smart contract. So 
every node has a copy of the smart contract. So that's the only difference basically from Bitcoin. It is more a, a smart uh, thinking uh, protocol, right? It has if clause. And this uh, issue with the Ethereum was, well, it was using the same proof of work protocol. Like basically, again, there were miners. Miners, we talked about mining. It's the creating a block of transactions to be added to the blockchain. So miners were working hard to publish these transactions, these blocks into the blockchain. And of course, similar to blockchain, similar to Bitcoin, these miners, and they are running computers, running the Ethereum software, and they are using a lot of time, computation power to produce these blocks to process the transaction. And the Ethereum got congested because they are the first smart protocol, smart contract protocol. And there were so many transactions happening. And uh, of course, when there are so many transactions happening, the network gets congested and it gets harder and harder uh, also for the miners to you know, find the hash as well. And they, similar to Bitcoin, started uh, Ethereum pools and they start to buy like much uh, more expensive hardwares. And uh, basically it become a really heavy protocol. And Ethereum developers realize that, well, because it got heavy, now the developers are charging a lot of fees in return of their work. And of course, these fees are getting, basically, they are uh, taken by developers who deploy their smart contracts, right, for their startups, or people from me and you, because we are using a dApp on Ethereum protocol. And of course, we have to pay their coin. We have to pay in terms of ETH. So, and that's why they start, they decided to switch from proof of work to proof of stake. So now let's a little bit talk about proof of stake right uh, now again in proof of stake we have the network of validators and these validators take their own crypto basically whatever protocol is in, in this case we're talking about ethereum v2 so they buy ethereum and they keep it they stake it and to be a validator actually you have to stake like let's say three thousand ethereum which corresponds to a hundred thousand dollars and being a validator now you have the chance to get some fees back right because now you are one of the players in that spider web you can validate a tr new transaction you can update the blockchain and earn the reward, right? And the spider web network, they have their own protocol names, of, obviously, of course. The network selects a winner based on the amount of crypto each validator has in the pool. Let's say I had 2,000, some other have 2,500 and so on. And I've been holding it for two years and the other person holding it for a year, right? So the length of time that we are holding that coin is also important. And the thing with this network is they are literally rewarding the most invested participants. So basically who is early in the market being a validator is earning more rewards at some point. Uh, but of course, there are some other criteria to pick the winner. So once the winner has been validated, Validated and actually once the winner has validated the latest block of transactions, other validators can also give thumbs up that block is accurate. And when there is enough thumbs up, basically when there are enough threshold numbers of thumbs up, the network updates the blockchain. So the chain is added into the Ethereum blockchain. All the transactions are processed successfully. As a return, all the participating validators receive a reward. This reward is in terms of native cryptocurrency. In the case of Ethereum uh, protocol, it's in terms of 8 ETH, right? And it is distributed by the network in proportion to the validator's stake. So I had 2,000, the other guy had 3,000. So he will get probably more rewards. I'm holding my stake for three years. He's holding for six months. So that will be also an important factor as well. So becoming a validator is a responsibility because you have to keep the network always on, right? You cannot go offline. So it brings a responsibility and also it brings, it requires a good level of technical knowledge. Well, these days that technical knowledge and 
gets can can be accessed easily um so the minimum amount of crypto that validators are required to stake is not little so be, to become a validator you have to in this case for ethereum 2 is 32 ethereum so 32 times almost two thousand uh, dollars right now it's two thousand three hundred is around seventy thousand dollars to become a validator and also there is a risk the validator can lose that money through a process called slash so basically your validator node goes offline, you lose the Ethereum. We were talking, it's a major responsibility, right? You cannot go off the grid. You as a being validator, validate a bad block of transactions, which means your software doesn't work the way the protocol has designed. So uh, other than that, there are still staking pools. So if you don't have enough money, which is 70,000, you can join a pool and you can run that validator node together with other you know, people. And you all become like a group or a society that runs that nodes, right? You become a validator altogether and you earn the reward and you split it within the group. All right. So let's a little bit talk more about Ethereum, which is the decentralized blockchain platform that is a peer-to-peer -peer network, obviously. But it's also the difference we said is now it's smart contract protocol. So we in the first module gave you some interface and Muratan explained how you can start writing a solidity code right through the Remy interface. And that's what it is. You like as a developer write a code and through the solidity and the code does a certain function, right? It has multiple functions and it can be a smart insurance protocol. It can be a DeFi protocol, right? It can have multiple different purposes and but at the background the protocol that lets it happen the first protocol was ethereum so and people start to understand the importance of smart contracts and then they start to come with different layer one protocols as we mentioned avalanche solano cardano right and uh, the nice thing with the smart contract protocols, uh, now they are decentralized, right? In the past, to make something happen, you know, for instance, like get notarized, you go to a notary in person and you need its stamp. Well, in this case, now the smart contract lets you do it digitally, secure, decentralized. You don't need a notary and also transparent and trustworthy, right? So basically, it's that's why we call it a disruption because it is changing the way that things work in our practical life. So uh, the Ether is the coin of Ethereum. Every layer one protocol has a coin associated with it. And Ether is Ethereum's coins. So a developer published to deploy a smart contract, they pay a fee to the Ethereum net. And let's say I publish a layer two company called Memo. And Memo basically finds other Memo in the world, right? And to just deploy this stupid smart smart contract on the Ethereum network, I write my code and I click deploy and I have to pay a fee. And that fee is called gas or gas price. And this price you have, you pay through the Ethereum coin, right? It's called Ether, ETA. And not just developers pay this fee. Let's say I, uh, some other people liked Memo so much, all the memos started to use my company, like my protocol, which is deployed on Ethereum. Right. So a memo came and clicked the button and to find other memos or to be included in the world of memos. And that's clicking that button makes that smart contract work. But that smart contract is on Ethereum. So that person has also have to pay a Ethereum, a gas fee. Right. So. The layer one protocols basically charge their layer two protocols or other users who use the layer two protocols, uh, the, their own coin. So gas is the cost of the Ethereum network charges in order to process that transaction. So in other words, ETH is the amount of the computer power required to verify a transaction, right? Because there are validators working to make this happen. You deploy that smart contract, smart contract is triggered and then change on on that contract the the initiation the execution it is on the entire ethereum web all the validator nodes are trying to process that transaction they are working working their software is so the, in return they get the reward and that reward is basically coming from usually the gas fees in the ethereum uh like basically one and two but those gas fees are now getting burned in ethereum too and there are a bunch of different aspects of it these days that's the story with the ethereum and there is other thing called erc20 and 
uh, this is different than Ether, right? The ERC-20 token is to create and issue the smart contract. ERC-20 is like basically it's a uh, token that provides those coding functions for the smart protocol. 20 token says that like the contract functions have to have this six property. They have to have a total supply. They have to have a balance function, allowance function, transfer function, approve function, and transfer from function. So these functions, they have to be deployed in all the smart contracts that use this protocol. And let's talk about a little bit the difference between coins and tokens. So the layer one protocols, they have actually coins. As I mentioned, Ethereum has ETH, Bitcoin has BTC, right? So their coins have some intrinsic value it is used for uh it is used within the protocol to do a lot of different tasks as i mentioned gas fee right so when a developer deploys a contract on ethereum has to pay a gas fee in terms of ethereum coin and the difference uh, between coin and token coin has intrinsic value but uh, as i mentioned i did a smart contract called memo right so the memo the layer two protocol my company well it, it is already built on ethereum one the protocol ethereum it is the one that defines the consensus he's the rule set i am just like an app the app that is working on that's living on ethereum and my cryptocurrency if i want to have one well it's a token right so if you have 10 memo tokens you can find 10 different memos in the world right so basically that token is a utility token it is used within that specific application which is the memo application right so i can use that memos to send a message to other memos i can send uh, collaboration messages i can start companies with other memos right so basically for every function every task i want to do in that app i have to spend some token uh in summary coins are layer one protocol tokens we call everything tokens coins are also tokens right all coins are tokens but not all tokens are coins so coins are tokens of layer one protocol we have this term called altcoin uh, and they are also considered as coins that are not bitcoin for instance xrp ripple is a layer one protocol and it's called altcoin uh, and tokens are cryptocurrencies that don't have their own blockchain they live on other blockchain and while they live on other blockchains basically they benefit from their technology such as they benefit from ethereum's consensus mechanism right and that consensus mechanism and also the ethereum tokens erc20 so this is a good summary of coin versus token if i want to say one more thing coins are typically used as a store of value you buy a house with a bitcoin or ethereum but you cannot necessarily buy something with a brave browser token right so what i'm saying is there are coins bitcoin ethereum litecoin there are these are the kings of the market and these are usually used as a store of value the tokens, well, they are not store of a value. They are utilities. They are mostly used for a purpose, for a payment, for switching, you know, some equities between, right? And uh, I think that's the most important difference between coins and tokens. I'll talk a little bit more about layer one protocols, like the most famous ones. So one of them is uh, Avalanche. Coin is Avax. Uh, and Avax uh, or uh, Avalanche is a company uh, that based out of Cornell and actually the founder or one of the founders is a Turkish professor from Cornell. He figured out Ethereum uh, is not as fast and because it was proof of work. So they came up with the different consensus mechanism, right? And that consensus mechanism actually is summarized here. Scalable, is robust, is highly decentralized, low latency, which means super fast, high throughput, means a lot of transactions per second. Uh, lightweight means uh, basically rather than having a one megabyte per block, maybe 0.1 megabyte per block, right? It's very lightweight. Supposedly, the consensus mechanism behind is very green and sustainable. Well, it's because of a kind of proof of stake. And I won't go to uh, like every single step of the consensus here. Uh, but the way this consensus uh, became valuable, uh, the reasoning behind it, it is uh, fast, right? Uh, it's low latency. And also it is still uh, decentralized at the same time, giving high 
high throughput. Uh, Avalanche came as a, a competitor to Ethereum, right? It was Ethereum 1 at that time. So proof of work wasn't as good as uh, people wanted in the market. They wanted to deploy uh, like layer 2 companies that work super fast. So Avalanche found this problem and came out on the market and uh, start to get a lot of DeFi companies. So DeFi companies want high throughput, right? Because they want to host a lot of transaction stuff. There are a bunch of DeFi companies started to build on Avalanche and now Avalanche positioned itself as a DeFi layer one company. So if you are a DeFi, well, you should build it on Avalanche, right? Because most of the other DeFi's are doing it. So that became the number one address. Then now they are trying to go into the NFT market, trying to get NFT companies build on their platform. They are going to metaverse companies. They are going to DAO companies. Like there is a big company called uh, Colony, uh, which is a DAO company. They built on basically Avalanche. So Avax is a native token of Avalanche, just like ETH is a native token of Ethereum. Avax is a native token of Avalanche, right? And just like Ethereum is used, that token is used to pay for fees, secure the platform for staking, right? As a validator, you need to have Avax if you want to participate in the consensus mechanism, right? I think it was like 1,000 Avax or something, and Avax is around uh, $80 right now. So it is around $80 to be a validator. So we talked about Solana. It is It was an Ethereum killer, uh, and the Solana had also focused on NFTs rather than DeFi. So a lot of different NFT companies are built on Solana and uh, that was basically their wipe and hype to host these different NFT companies. Uh, Coin is Sol and similar to other ones, Sol is used to create the staking mechanism, right? As well as uh, transferring value, which means developers have to have Sol to deploy their contracts, right? If I am an NFT company and I want to build I need some Sol token to deploy my protocol and company on Solana. And if I'm a user of that NFT company, right, I also need the token of that NFT company to do transactions like utility tokens. And also I might need Solana to do some different transactions in that NFT company because the main asset is always the layer one, right? Yeah, so like my question was like, can we have different consensus mechanism that the rich people isn't always have the advantage from the rest of the people <laughs> great question uh well probably if you do find one well you'll be one of the richest ones <laughs> um i think uh the consensus mechanism is a really important one and i think there is still a huge problem t- sitting there and that's exactly the, s- the stuff that we discussed we don't want a consensus that that may reach the richer the proof of work is not working but other consensus mechanisms we gave an example at the beginning of the slides called sharding right then there are some other ones uh called uh starks s-t-a-r-k so um there are some other ones but uh obviously they have their own disadvantages as well uh, but let's discuss on more on Discord. There is Cosmos. So Cosmos is the blockchain project aiming to enable different blockchains to communicate. It. So for instance, uh, I want Ethereum to communicate with uh, Solana, right? And that is a tough one because they are totally different blockchain products. So that's why it is called entire blockchain communication protocol. And a lot of people find this layer one protocol very valuable because it can empower the cross talk so basically it can let different protocols talk to and interoperate interoperate with each other. it's also called internet of blockchains because it is having different blockchains like connect each other like a web uh, and there is another one called polkadot and polkadot is called uh inter- again this is similar to the cosmos they focus on web3 but one of the main difference between cosmos and polkadot is that Polkadot offers a unified security. So compared to Cosmos, it's focused on the security of the protocol much more than the other crypto. It's a little bit different than the other ones. It's also proof of stake, but uh, works a little bit different uh, using Polkadot Relay Chain. We'll talk about these protocols much more. This is just an introduction, like knowing that they exist there and there is a competition among them, like a big competition. And the competition is to get more layer two companies, right? They want more and more companies 
companies on their network. And why? Because those companies, layer two companies, like the one example I gave, the memo, well, the developers are basically paying the currency of that protocol. The users are paying in terms of that protocol. So eventually the circulation happens and the more circulation, the better is the platform, right? So it's like uh, if there is no like circulation, if everybody puts their Turkish liras in the bank, well, that country goes down, right? So for a live economy, for a wipe economy, the currency, the coin should be circulated. Polkadot focus a lot on Web3 and uh, the Web3 is their basically target. And the target means, uh, like we talk about a little bit oracles and Chainlink, right? So they talk with Chainlink a lot and they try to do a lot of projects together. Basically, the data on the Web3, it needs to be also decentralized and it needs to be trustworthy and secure and stuff, right? So they treat data just like coins. Like basically, they want the communication of data to be secure. So that's why they call Polkadot a Web3 uh, data company. So there are a bunch of other layer ones, Cardano, Tezos, uh, Celo, and they have different uh, business models, but they're all layer one companies. Uh, Tezos got famous with NFT. So basically the singers, uh, entertainment uh, people in US, uh, they start to build their own NFTs or NFT companies and they deploy on Tezos, right? The singer Jay-Z, like the Shakira and a bunch of different ones, uh, they start to build NFT companies because they think that being early to the market and reaching to an audience through NFTs is valuable, right? So and most built their layer two companies or NFTs uh, on the companies that are hosted on Tezos and Tezos became, became like uh, very valuable in turn in the entertainment industry. Uh, so obviously as a return XTZ price, which is the Tezos coin increased in value. Feel free to search more about these layer one companies, especially the ones here. Phantom is a big smart contract layer one company and uh, they had some issues these days. Some of the team members left, but they are still surviving. Cardano is one of my favorites, but they couldn't really excel like Ethereum. I mean, it took years for Ethereum to develop the Ethereum V2. Uh, but Cardano has a lot of software issues like uh, source issues, code -ish coding issues, and they cannot still uh, host uh, a lot of layer two companies. So they couldn't really attract audience basically.